always truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast for insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Welcome back, everybody. Greatest podcast ever. And uh, today we're going to talk politics, but uh, of course, in a high minded way. And to help us with that conversation, I actually have one of my old professors from Harvard, David King. David, thanks so much for being on. Hey, it's so good to see you again, Dan. It's been fun to watch you. It was fun to watch you when you were a student. It was absolutely fabulous watching your, your uh, run for office and now seeing you do your thing. You know, we're all very proud of you. Well, appreciate it, and um, appreciate what you what you taught us. I we'll go we'll get into that throughout the class. Some of, some some little nuggets that I took from you that I didn't even realize were good nuggets until later, uh, and, and I thought that was really interesting about how you taught those classes. So I, I want to read a little bit out of your bio so people know more about you. You joined the Harvard faculty in 1992. Uh, since 1996, you've chaired Harvard's bipartisan program for newly elected members of the U.S. Congress. So that means the new freshman class, they go up to Cambridge, they spend a, a few days up there, we get classes, it's, it's a chance to get to know each other. It, it's been a longstanding tradition at this point. I think the last couple of years have been a little screwed up because of COVID, but um, it was cool for me to go back to doing, to, and do that, um, given that I, I remember being a fly on the wall uh, as a student, just looking at, 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 at these members of Congress coming through, just, just to go see what was going on. Um, you also chair Harvard's program for senior senior executives in state and local government. Um, you've directed the task force on election administration for the National Commission on Election Reform, uh, you, the, which was the Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter uh, project. That's an interesting one in, in this day and age. Um, I've referenced that that particular commission um, in, in in a few cases. Uh, you've written quite a few books here, uh, co-author, author of three books. Um, you've been published in a number of places. You regularly speak on, on U.S. elections uh, and politics and U.S. Congress to a variety of audiences. So the class I took, I took both of your classes. And um, uh, the one that stands out, of course, was the one called U.S. Congress uh, because I, I actually played the role of the Texas second district uh, congressman. And at the time I had zero, like, I mean, literally zero uh, motivation or plans to run for that seat. <laughs> it was kind of funny how that ended up. Um, so thanks for being on. And um, so b- before we started recording, you mentioned that you wore my shirt before it was cool. Are you sure it was cool to wear my t-shirt in Cambridge? That doesn't seem like a good place to wear that t-shirt. Um. Yeah, I wore it at Planet Fitness, and no one knew what to make of it. So it was before you were a household name, and uh, you know I felt a little badass just being able to walk around in it. Uh, first, I don't think I've been in a Planet Fitness since you know you were elected, but it's those are good memories. <laughs> well, you got to get back in, man. It's the New Year's New Year's resolution. You know what else are we doing? <laughs> um, let, let's start broad. I mean, you, you you've been studying the U S Congress for, for quite a long time. What, what I, what I thought was interesting about your classes is, 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 is you focused a lot on how, what the lifestyle is like, what's it, what's it like to be in Congress? What are the considerations that you're taking into account? What are the incentives that you face? And it was a little at the time, maybe a little hard to understand where you were, where you were going with that. But I, I've wanted to have you on the podcast for a while, just to sort of dive back into some of these lessons and, and compare it to my experience thus far. Um, I guess we've got a lot of questions, but maybe let's start generally. What do you think about the current state of things? Is it uh, worse than ever before, like some people say, or is it uh, just another chapter in American history? Well, I mean, we've had some, it's, of course it's another chapter in American history, but it's uh, obviously exceptionally polarized one of the three great epochs of polarization. One, of course, led to a civil war. And that's about the level of polarization we're at right now. Um, But it doesn't mean we're going to head towards a civil war. There are ways of coming out of it. Um, Congress is not functioning. It's uh, not functioning certainly the way it was designed to function. And um, 
what we try to do in the class that you took is blend the theory of how things are allegedly supposed to be. You know, here's what the Constitution says, here's what the rules and procedures look like, um, but put that in the context of what's it actually like to do this and look at somebody in the eye and say, you know, I can't be with you on this one. As you know, we talk, we talk about being able to stab someone in the heart but never stabbing someone in the back. So it's that play between um, the, the theoretical structure, you have to be able to understand the rules and procedures, but also what's it like on a day in and day out basis. Um, and we, we used to talk about the 80-20 rule, uh, which was that 80 percent of the work is done by 20 percent of the members and 80 percent of the work is done in the last 20 percent of the days. Um, but you know that that's wrong. Uh, now we call it the 90-10 rule. Yeah, I was going to say, I was like, it's still kind of right. But yeah, it's more like 90-10. Yeah, 90 percent <laughs> of the work is done by 10 percent of the members and 90 percent of the work is done in about 10 percent of the days. And the people who we often see out there on TV or here on the radio um, uh, are not necessarily in that 10% who are making a difference. And so what we try to do is emphasize the, the behaviors um, that will make it more likely that you're going to be able to sit down with somebody and, and put together a coalition and get a bill passed. Uh, we talk about polarization. Um, and again, some people say it's more polarized than ever. I, I think you could argue with that. It, there's been some pretty bad times in America. You don't have to go all the way back to the Civil War by any stretch. I mean, in 1968. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was, yeah. It, it was rough. Um, but you, you, uh, you've you done research on this about why things become polarized because a popular narrative out there as well, you know, gerrymandering, things like that. I think there's a lot of easy buttons that people press with explaining the curtain's current state of affairs. Uh, tell us about that research and what you found about American polarization. Uh, it's a big topic. The first thing to remember is that our minds tend to try and grasp on to um, unicausal things. So, oh, it's gerrymandering. You know, there's no real competition in these districts. You just play to the base. You win the primary. You're going to win it all. The D's are, you know, it doesn't matter in, in Illinois' fourth congressional district if you're a Republican. It doesn't matter in this congressional district in Massachusetts if if you're a Republican. It's a Democrat who's always going to win. And, 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 and what's, and what's we? Oh, sorry. I just want to say that. There, it's a complicated, there's so many elements that kind of work towards polarization. Gerrymandering is one among several, and it's certainly not the most important. Yeah, and what's weird about the gerrymandering, I don't want to spend too much time on the gerrymandering thing, but, but let's do it for a little bit. It, what's weird about that argument is, if that were true, you know, like for instance, I'll, I'll take my district, my, my old district and my now new district. My old district was, a, you know, a, a R4 is, is it, it's kind of a rough estimate, but Trump only won my district by one point. So it is far from this deep red district. Okay, so, so, so for the people who say they want these closer districts that are more competitive and therefore will reduce polarization and make everything better, then why were you also destroying me on, online all the time because you didn't like the shape of my district? And what is it about the shape of a district that makes it corrupt or corruptly drawn? You know, people focus in on the shape and I, and I point this out to people because I'm like, it could, it could mean that it could, it doesn't necessarily. And I just want to get people thinking about that because now my new district is really not that competitive. It's much redder. So is that better or is it worse? But it looks better. It looks like a, like a simple shape as opposed to this weird shape. And so I, you know, I, I don't think I'm coming up with any clear answers here. I'm just trying to get people to think about what it means to be gerrymandered. Dan, I mean, using a word like corruption is mm, problematic, right? Um, so parties will write the, the lines or draw the lines in a state uh, in ways to advantage the party in power and the incumbents uh, within that party in particular. And if you can manage to bundle or put two incumbent other party members in so they have to defeat each other, that's fine. That's not corrupt, okay? That yeah. is the parties doing what parties do best, which is look out for their own interests. But as you know, I mean, I think we should all just acknowledge up front that um, political parties are not in the democracy business and candidates are not in the democracy business. Dan Crenshaw might sort of as, you know, a podcast host be on in the democracy business, but candidates and 
political parties are in the getting your number business, which means you need one more vote than the next candidate. And that's true in the primary. It's certainly true in the general election. You've got to get your number. So, so what does it mean to be in the getting your number business? Uh, well, you know, in a democracy, whoever gets the most votes wins. It's, it's, not, having, uh, it's not winning by a thousand votes. It's winning by one vote or two votes. And so if you're in committee, for example, and there are, you know, 51 people in the committee, you've got to be able to count to 26. You've got to be able to get 26 votes to get a majority. Or if you're running um, in uh, a race for city council and you know that it's going to take probably 1,400 votes to win, even though the town has 50,000 people in it, you organize your campaign around getting 1,200, 1,400 votes. You identify those voters early. You map your time backwards. You focus on the, the proven wells where you can fish for really committed voters. And so candidates and campaigns are in the getting your number business. If the number is 26 for a committee, congratulations. If the number is 1,200 for a city council race, congratulations. Or if the number is, you know, 45,000 to win a congressional primary. Congratulations, it's possible in some settings. Um, and you wanna do it as a candidate um, by spending as few resources, as much of your own time and money as possible. So you go after the proven voters. You don't go after young voters, new voters. You, know, you, you, you send people into the old folks home, and you, you, you turn out that vote. And that's rational, that's what you should do as a candidate. And that's what a political party should do, just beat the other party. But I think democracy should be about bringing along the next generation, getting them active, getting them voting, um, bringing in new citizens who will vote. And those are hard, if you're a candidate, to, to reach. And sometimes you're going to mobilize them and they're going to vote for the other party. Candidates and political parties, Dan, are not in the democracy business. They're in the getting the number business. And, and, and I want to it's up to others, us, you, um, to simply encourage more participation. And I want to expand on what you're saying um, because I, I understand what you're saying, uh, but I, I want to expand upon it, make sure it's clear to people. What, what you're explaining is the incentive structure, and it, it is an explanatory device for why things are polarized because people ask all the time, what about the middle, the so-called middle? And I say so-called because I'm not exactly sure what the middle is. And people ask, what about a third party? Can there just be a third party that just does the reasonable stuff? And I'm like, but what's the reasonable stuff? Well, this is what the reasonable stuff is. And I'm sure this other reasonable person agrees with me. Well, guess what? They don't. And I can't form a base out of that. I can't form a voter base, which is what you're referring to, out right. of that out of that supposed so-called third party that just believes in the reasonable, reasonable stuff. I mean, the entire point of politics is to disagree on what is right, on what is the best outcome. And, and that's always going to happen. I mean, to some extent, there has to be polarization. If you, if you just have full-on agreement, then, then you might argue that's a, a more dangerous situation, to be honest. The question is how we disagree. Do we do so peacefully and thoughtfully? And um, with some kind of mutual respect, do we have at least a basis of agreement, you know, which I would call the founding principles from then which we derive disagreements post that. But um, so what you're saying is important because it explains to people, I think, the incentive structures for running. And I'm not sure that we ever get out of that, 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 that fact pattern. Well, uh, it, it's problematic in that. Um, it does give people the impression that you have these two rather extreme camps. Mm -hmm. And most people like to view themselves as sort of reasonable and moderate. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when you engage them in conversation, you'll find out they have some very deeply held beliefs. And as you know, politics is about values. It's the authoritative allocation of values. It's not just sort of changing tax structure and giving this to other people. At its core, it's about um, our values as citizens. And uh, those ought to be things that we contest over, we fight about. Uh, we ought to hold deep values and hold on to them dearly. But, but I, do, I, wanna, I wanna focus on one thing that you said though, and that is that there, when you sit down to have negotiations with somebody else, um, it's almost always better 
to focus on the things you have in common. Uh, and you can be coming from very different places, but focus on the things that you hold together, right? Where did you grow up? What do you, what do you think about uh, Texas football? Um, how's your mom? And you begin conversations there and start building that personal trust and care about the other person. Uh, and that's at the heart of successful politics in Washington. What we see on TV, you know, these yapping and barking at each other can be really effective and presumably entertaining and people are going to click on it because they get outraged or they're entertained. Um, but that's not how legislation ultimately moves. And it's ha not how Dan Crenshaw's going to continue to make a difference for Texas. And, and going back to the polarization. So in your research, what, what I remember you talking about is, is what you found with respect to committee votes. And I thought this was a, a pretty interesting revelation where committee votes used to be secret. You, you used to not know how a member voted in committee. And, um, so uh, maybe I should explain a little bit more for the audience. Uh, everybody, well, not everybody, but, but most, just about everybody in Congress is on a committee. Um, and uh, I'm on the Energy and Commerce Committee. So, and I'm on two subcommittees within that. So that's sort of your, you know, as, as David, as you put it, and you, I'm stealing words from you that you said in class that I didn't get until I was in Congress, but you said most members need to choose a major right? And a minor, you needed to focus on something. And so for me, everybody assumed that would be armed services, but it really wasn't. For me, it became energy, environment, and healthcare. And so that's what I did. And so you, you focus your legislative efforts, generally speaking, on, on those committees. I, I do legislation. I work on legislation that would be in another committee's jurisdiction occasionally. But I, I have a lot more say because I'll, I'll, I'll go through markups. I'll go through, which is like an editing process for, for a, a bill. I'll go through that on my committee and then it comes out. And then we, we always vote on legislation in the committee before it comes to the floor. Not always, but just for the most part, that's what you do. Right. Um, and so it's interesting that at a certain, what year did we change this to where, where the, these votes were transparent? Well, the, the, the big change happens first on the House floor uh, and it happens after the 1970 Legislative Reorganization Act. Throughout congressional history, um, the votes on amendments. So if you have a bill that comes to the floor, um, the final passage on that bill was always public. You could always see how people were going to vote. But votes on amendment, which is refining or shaping the legislation, were cloaked. Um, you only got the final tally. And it was then on the floor that you would do all of this, you know, you would trade, you would talk, you would say, well, okay, I'm willing to vote as long as no one kind of knows it, right? You know, mm -hmm. it, you, a lot of the, the real work of compromise can happen as long as not everyone is watching. But the 1970 Legislative Reorganization Act changed that. Now, what's important is that the um, coalition that pushed for that reform was led by lobbyists. And behind the scenes, they called it the Full Employment Act the Full Employment Act for lobbyists, because you you didn't know if you were, you know, convincing someone to vote for you, you didn't know if they were going to stay bought uh, because you couldn't actually track their votes. And then after Watergate, um, committee hearings also opened up. You remember in, in well, it used to be that you would sit around a long table and face the other members of the party. So if you were a brand new member, you'd sit sort of at the little kid's end of the table and you'd be looking face to face with the person from the other party. But with this all opening up, it physically changed. You have the, the chair and the ranking member at the center, and then you have the most junior members down dais, as far to the left and as far to the right. Uh, and instead of talking to each other, they're talking to the audience. Um, and we don't legislate in public. You don't compromise in public. The, there's this old saying, of course, that you, there are two things you don't want to see being made, right? You don't want to see sausage being made, and you don't want to see laws being made um, because it's messy. But the difference is that if you look at sausage being made, it doesn't ruin the sausage. But there are times, it's not always the case, but there are times 
when a little too much sunshine can completely wilt it. Um, and there's a reason, Dan, that the founding fathers wrote the Constitution in secret. They didn't allow anyone to come in. They didn't have recorded votes. Uh, they said, you know, listen, I'm, I'm going to have to compromise on some things. They're going to kill me back home on this, but they're not going to find out. If we have enough trust in our legislators, we ought to let them be uh, so they can get the work done. And that's a genie that's going to be hard ever to get back in the bottle, Dan. Oh, no, I, no way. <laughs> I would never advocate for it. Uh, not a chance. Yes, but you'll notice uh, that you find other <laughs> ways to have time with members. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, we don't do conference committees anymore. Uh, there'll be a smaller clique now um, associated with the leadership that'll come together and try and craft legislation. Um, uh, but that And that'll be done relatively secretly. And of course, senior staff are very involved. So it, the, by, by focusing everybody's efforts on, oh, look what's happening in committee, we can all watch. Now it's a smaller group doing the work behind yet another closed door. It, it, and that is true. It becomes a smaller group. I, that seems to be the outcome because it still gets done. And, and, and a good example of how this sort of, you know, it, it, it's transparency, but somebody's only looking at the process with, you know, with the, with the specific view, right? Through a very narrow lens, meaning they don't understand how it got there. They just react. A good example of this was the recent NDAA, the military spending bill, where Republicans like me just got slaughtered because we voted for initial passage out of the House. This was months and months ago. And um, there were some problematic things in that particular bill, specifically a, 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 kind of like this um, sort of an anti-gun legislation in there that, that would be a red flag law for active duty military members. Drove a lot of people nuts. Now, we voted on that knowing full well, because we'd already asked this question, hey, this, this is already out of the bill, right? And the answer was definitively yes. So we all knew it was going to be out. And we voted on the final one just a few weeks ago. And, of course, it wasn't in there. But this caused endless consternation. And what's interesting, and that the other thing I wanted to hit on, because I, don't, I, don't rem I didn't understand that it was as a lobbyist-driven change, right? You would, who would imagine that? Like, more transparency is a lobbyist-driven change. And why is that? Because I guess back then, because I don't think this is totally the case now. I don't want to get your take on it. Back then, the lobbying groups were more... But they had more influence over members, it seems to me. I, I don't I do not think that lobbyists in Washington have a ton of influence. I mean, they their their influence is it doesn't seem to be the way that at least the popular culture thinks it is. Uh it's it's not that influential. Now, who does have a lot of influence are the outside groups, right? The the ones who stir up voters. In the end, I think politicians are just afraid of their voters. In the end, their incentive structure is to get reelected. And some people are like, well, that's awful. And I'm like, well, it's better than financial incentives. <laughs> I mean, I mean I, I'm not sure what a more perfect system would look like. You still have to earn the trust of more than 50% of your constituents. That's at least something. Um, and, and groups that try to change people's minds, they have influence. And it's, 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 so I'm saying a few different things there. I think it's interesting that lobbyists push for that. And I think it's interesting how other outside groups have kind of adapted to that sort of accountability phase, which again, is it a bad thing? I'm, I'm not sure it's a bad thing. It just is. Well, no, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's a bad thing in general on average. Um, it's a bad thing. Uh, the, but let's distinguish between two types of lobbying groups or lobbying approaches. One is outside lobbying. And that's where a group is trying to reach constituents who are then going to contact you right? Or contact the legislator. Call mm -hmm. before midnight tonight. Mm -hmm. and, and the way you do that is you focus on something fairly simple, usually something that will aggravate the, the potential caller. And then yeah. you make it easy to contact your office or to send an email or whatever. And people feel good about it because they're enraged. Um, that's outside lobbying. Now, those people you don't actually want to see in your office very often, the people who are running those outside lobbying firms. They're called lobbying campaigns for a reason because they look like a campaign for somebody running for office, right? Right. The basic idea is to fit on a bumper sticker and it's vote yes or vote no. The people who actually move votes and shape legislation, though, are inside lobbyists. They'll be um, people with deep expertise, um, you know, real policy experts who can tell you both sides of the argument. 
And I'll tell you, you're on one of the most important committees and probably the most fascinating in energy and commerce. So people are going to be lining up to try and teach you some things. And they become, uh, they come prepared with information about what this is going to do for Texas and what it'll do for the nation. And they'll try and summarize the other side of the argument. And if they ever lie to you face to face in a meeting, they're not going to get another meeting with you. So you have these very different kinds of lobbying approaches. Um, the inside lobbying is where a huge amount of influence can happen on a handful of situations with the right people at the right time. But what most people see these days are all these, you know, the internet blasts from the outside lobbyists, which are there to try and, you know, stir up trouble or support the organization that's actually doing it. Right. And, and so like a, like a good example of an outside lobbying organization would be, you know, NRA or something, um, or it'd be Planned Parenthood on the left, right? It'd be, these would be outside lobbying organizations um, that you're talking about. Inside lobbying. Well, they, both the NRA and, and, and Planned, Parenthood would all, Planned Parenthood would also have some parts of their organization that'll come in and talk to you and try and shape legislation. But yes, they're very That's good sure. at ginning up things. I'm, I'm thinking not only of, um, uh, what was it? People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. What was this? Uh, I can't remember the name Peter? of the organization um, that that went after Maine for their bear baiting law. I think it was in yeah. 2014. So there's this statewide uh, proposal to ban bear baiting. Um, and this, this national organization, you know, started raising money on it. And and, you know, very little. It, it was to try, to try and raise money, not to necessarily change the law. And so that, you know, fills their coffers because people are outraged in the state of Maine. Oh, my goodness. People up there in Maine, they're all maniacs and they're baiting their bears with donuts and then shooting the bears. Right. <laughs> um, so uh, that created a completely predictable backlash in Maine uh, in which people who hadn't voted in their lifetime uh, came literally out of the woods and and voted. Um, and they ended up with a surprise governor in Paula Page who would not have won had bear baiting not become this national issue to try and feed the coffers of an interest group not even involved in Maine. So there are just weird consequences when you start ginning this kind of excitement up among voters. I mean, I see those weird consequences almost daily and and with social media those those kind that kind of ginning up of emotion happens r rather quickly and and more often and i think it's driving america crazy no, you know, I, 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 I i'm not you know again social media is very beneficial to me and as, as just as a tool of communication but if it disappeared today I, I do think people would just be generally happier, <laughs> you know, you know and, and, and there's something to be said for that. Um, and so, the, okay. So there's these outside groups. And the only thing I wanted to elaborate on was, was how, what role they play in Congress. And cause I want to, I like I like to use this podcast to illuminate some inside workings for people. So these outside groups, they, they are meaningful because that that's what causes a thousand angry comments on what post I make, you know, and, and I have to com com constantly remind myself it's not real. It's, it's really, it's not real because you, I can talk to 10,000 people in my district and they're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, I don't even know what controversy you're talking about. And the inside lobbyists, you know, people always, people have this misconception of the inside lobbyists that you're talking about, that, that they run the place with money and nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, their, their ability to throw around money is very, very minimal. Um, it's, it's, it's just not a consideration, it's, it's especially for, for most of us who, mostly small dollar donations but what they do have is information and then it's up to a good this is why you need to elect somebody with decent judgment because then it's up to the member to judge whether this information is truthful or not and for healthcare in particular i mean this is a great example where i have lobbyists from all different walks of healthcare sectors you know whether it's pharmaceuticals on one end uh, doctors associations on another hospitals over here they all have different interests it doesn't mean any of them specifically are corrupt or evil or bad, but they do have different interests. And it's up to us to judge the proper path based on a set of principles that I said I was running on. 
You know, in my case, of course, that's conservative, limited government principles. So I have to apply those based on the information in front of me and, and, and move forward. Now, I will say that these outside groups, if they want to gin up a bunch of emotion about something that was like good policy, um, here's, here's a good example. Here's a great example of another recent one was this whole vaccine database nonsense that I was skewered for. Like everybody thought we voted for a vaccine database because some reporter said so. Right, some some twenty seven year old reporter you've never heard of somehow changed the narrative in America. None of it was true. This was solid policy, um, and yet it got ginned up that way. So it's as a as a question of power. It does seem like because of social media, some of these outside groups have an outsized power, and I wonder if that contributes negatively to some of the the general polarization we see. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I, I do think so. You know, we have these, the limited capa- capacity as humans to take in information, right? And so we're, we're looking for very efficient ways to process what's coming in, right? What we're seeing, what we're reading, what we're hearing. And we kind of go into these standard patterns um, that are knee-jerk liberal or knee-jerk conservative because we're just being bombarded with stuff all the time. And as the internet has increased the frequent, increased the amount that we're being bombarded with, instead of kind of sifting through it and thinking it through, we're, we are reacting and going from a place of emotion. But as an elected official, um, you have this amazing ability to bring people together. And Dan, I'm wondering if, I'm wondering what would happen if um, you, you know, you have a meeting coming up with someone from pharma uh, and they're going to come in and pitch you on something or give you some background information on the policy area. What if you invited in for the same half hour somebody from the American Hospital Association or some other expert? Because you do right now, it's kind of this sequence of experts coming in with their own perspective, trying to sort of describe what the entire policy space looks like but you dan can be a convener uh and 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 bring opponents together in your office and say okay what's what's really going on here and how how should i really think about this you're in the perfect place for a tutorial well that's actually easy what you just described is very easy and it happens often um what's what's much harder is is to to get a Democrat colleague to come over and say, look, this is why I believe in insurance, health insurance, the way I believe in it. Like, can we talk to like that? That that's that's the hard part, um, because you know we've gotten to this point where I'll I'll talk to a Democrat colleague behind the scenes, and they're like, oh yeah, I know this is a disaster, and I'm like, well, but, but then, but but you're not saying that out loud. You're not saying it with your voting. So, so where, where are we at here? It, it, we, we've gotten to this point where it's impossible to persuade fellow members of Congress. I'm not sure it was ever possible to persuade a fellow member of Congress. What you have to do is persuade their voters to pressure them to, to then act a certain way. Yeah, what do you think about no, that? Certainly, it was possible to persuade a member by putting things in terms that you know they care about. So if they are, you know, driven by water policy and your issue happens to have some tangential thing with water policy, you play on water policy and bring them along. The the personal relationships, though, Dan, since, since before you got there, uh, it's really, it's really begun, begun to be very, very difficult. When, you know, I started teaching in 92 and I taught um, a little before that when I was a grad student at the University of Michigan, Go Blue. Um, and there was this hard and fast rule, although it wasn't written down, so it was like a heavy norm, that if you were a sitting member of Congress, you would never go into an opponent, somebody in the other party, into their district and campaign against them. Absolutely not. And senators wouldn't even go into the state to campaign against a sitting senator. Because if, if, what, what matters is being able to sit down and have those conversations and pass good policy. How am I going to trust somebody who just came into my district and supported my opponent 
and is raising money against me. So it was a hard and fast rule. And the first time it was violated was in 1994 when Newt Gingrich's group um, actually went out there and went into Democrat districts. And then uh, you get to 1996 and lo and behold, the Democrats did likewise. Uh, so they won't go in. Uh, so they started going in. Now, how, how are you going to sit down and, and have common cause when I know that something I tell you um, might come out and, and hurt me later on? We have to be able to reestablish those, um, those corridors of trust. And, and another sneaky and terrible thing that was happening about the same time, Dan, is that um, members were told, hey, what you really need to do is you, you're going to have to focus on your sophomore election. So don't move your family to D.C. Whatever you do, don't move your family to D.C. Um, and that was done straight up, hand to God, Dan, it was done because leadership didn't want you all talking to each other. Um, leadership understands that when you start building those coalitions and, and relationships early on, it's going to be more difficult to actually lead. So it happened first again with the 104th Congress with the Republicans and then in the 105th Congress with the Democrats. And now most members are spending a lot of time back home. Kids aren't growing up going to the same schools in Washington, D.C., and people are afraid of their afraid of their constituents, and they're running home to them all the time. But uh, my strong advice for somebody who has the courage to do it is move to Washington, because that's where you're going to get something done. You're going to meet people in the gym. You're going to go to dinner. You'll go to some congressional delegation trips, and you'll get done uh, what needs to be done. Yeah, of course, the problem is nobody lives in Washington anymore. So you'd be living up there alone. Um, you know, and it's, 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 not the, it's not the easiest life. Um, you know, people don't realize, like, we, we, we got to have two places. Um, you either get an apartment in D.C. Or you, uh, or you get a hotel or you sleep in your office. And um, you don't have a shower if you're sleeping in your office. So that's not a great uh, – not a great option, though. A lot of members choose it. Yeah, they go down to the gym if they sleep yeah. in their office. I think it's, it's gross. Um, <laughs> it's it's I, not I a hate good. I into a member's office, and you know, you know, an hour earlier they were asleep on this couch. It's just kind of gross. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um, and it, it's it, it's it's not it's not sustainable. Um, and, and and not not only do people uh, campaign in each other's districts, uh, but it's uh, it, within the same party. This is happening a lot more. Um, you know, the sort of the squads that have arisen from, from both sides. Um, yeah, I will bro. say, you know, to, to like, if I was talking to your class and I was trying to give them some understanding of the incentive structures that we have to campaign against somebody. Um, I'll say for me, it's, it's after someone has betrayed me. So I, I, I don't want to be the first, that's kind of a rule I try to live by. I will not be the first to betray you, but once you do it to me, even if it's slight, I will come after you. And uh, I've, I've held to that promise pretty well. And because unfortunately things, things have gotten petty and personal um, in, in, in this house. Like people I thought were like, okay, this is somebody I can build a relationship with. This is somebody I've got some common ground with. Let's do And then uh, there's a tweet that comes out and I'm like, where the hell did that come from? You know, and it's, and then it's game on or they, uh, <laughs> Or they try to find me five thousand dollars for some nonsense. I mean, now you're coming after my personal income. I mean, this is, this is, this has gotten toxic. This is a, this is a precedent setter. This recent thing in this last year, where you're imagining, imagine your workplace where fifty one percent can vote to take paychecks away from the other forty nine percent. This is a toxic working environment that yeah. that yeah, we're and, in at and, this point. You know, wait until next, uh, wait until next January when the Republicans control the House and see what see what it feels like then. Um, it's gonna. It's, it's gonna. It's a, It's it's really. It's it's really terrible. And um, if if you can find those few members on the Democrat side and you know, build relationships there, it could be the kernel that can continue to grow. And when you were here, you know, you had friends of all stripes. Uh, you're very personable. You're you know you're open. Um, you, you don't you don't play dirty. Um, 
that's the kind of approach that ought to work in D.C. But we're li- we're living in a year after you know January sixth, and um, and the animosity and the suspicion is incredibly intense. It can't last that long. That can't be forever. I, so- I think people are too tired to to keep it up at, at a certain point. I, I, politics, the, the general air of politics, is in a strange place right now. Again, it, lately my controversies have been with my own side. Um, because it, it seems as though everybody acknowledges Republicans are going to take over. So now there's this, it's not even a battle for policy. That's what's so frustrating about the silliness of, 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 of some of these divisions. They're manufactured. You know, the, it, now I don't think that's the same on the left. And I'd be curious what your opinion is on that. But I think there's a wide, wide difference between Bernie Sanders and obviously Joe Manchin. But let's not even use Joe Manchin as an example. Let's just use whatever other moderate Democrat. There's a pretty large divide there from a policy perspective. When it comes to more moderate Republicans versus the more extreme Republicans, it's more a matter of tone, in my opinion. And uh, because conservatism by nature lives in a box, like that's the kind of the whole point. It's limiting. You can't just go making up new conservative principles. That's the entire point of it. You know, we, we, we work with things that work. We work on principles that we believe work and have a longstanding tradition of working. And so it, it becomes a matter of tone. And there's this weird fight that goes on there. Um, I've, I've almost forgotten the point I was making, but I, I, I think, um, I, I guess my point was that it's just it's a it's a strange time, um, and I, I think people are almost bored and looking for reasons to be angry about stuff. But I do think the vast majority of Americans are tuned out to American politics at the moment. I think they're frustrated with basic issues like inflation, the economy, the, the border, some foreign policy with Afghanistan, et cetera. But most people have tuned out. That's my basic take um, as I assess where people are at. And I think most people are dreading another election season, to be honest. No, I think they are. And the, the, the part that I just want to, I know there's a lot of people are saying, oh my goodness, you, whatever you do, don't run for school board these days, right? Because people are, are, are batty and they're coming after you. No, actually, Dan, get people to run for school board. I mean, run for planning commissions. The, the way you learn how to legislate is by practicing and by uh, putting together a coalition and getting your number and crafting legislation at the very, very local level. Now, you didn't do that. You jumped to the big time because, you know, you're Dan and you can do that. But but most legislators are going to learn um, by, um, you know, by doing it at a very local level. Uh, and, and you can tell which members came from different kinds of places. You can tell who was a mayor before they went off to Congress. And you can sort of tell who came from a planning board. They have a different way of, of, of handling things. Or someone like Senator Luger who came, you know, from, well, he was, he was um, uh, mayor of Indianapolis first. But before that, he was on school committee. And he used to say that there's never been anything harder in his political life than dealing with school committee in Indianapolis. So um, it's a pretty bleak time in Washington. But there are 515,000 elected officials in the United States, overwhelmingly at the very local level, overwhelmingly not paid. And if we want to change things, let's just turn off the TV and get involved, go to those Monday night meetings and make a difference locally. Um, politics is a blunt instrument and a lot of stuff simply can't be done in Washington. And I'm, I'm very happy to see that there's a, a lot of vitality at the state and local level. Oh, well, there's a movement, uh, at least on the conservative side, to, to run for school board elections. Um, and I'm all for it. Uh, we, we get involved in school board elections now. I mean, I, I, I tell people this all the time. Because be, people tend to come to their congressman with every problem, right? The streets are dirty. There's homelessness. There's their, their schools are teaching crap they don't like. And I'm like, I, I, I hate to feel power. I mean, I just, I have my role, right? And I, I vote. I literally, my role is to vote on federal legislation. Other things you just said are, are federally legislated, and it, you know, it's frustrating to people. Um, but it's, it, it is what it is. So you should absolutely run for these positions. Um, but but I'll, but of course, before you run, you know, be informed about why you're running. I remember something you said, and again, this is one of those things I didn't quite grasp at the moment. But later on, it was useful. 
the number one thing you need to do when running for a position is to know why. A deep reason why you're running. And it could be some kind of personal story you had. Maybe it's a specific issue. Maybe there's a deep-seated philosophy. But you got to know why, and you got to be able to articulate that from the heart. Right. And that's a, a difference between the fairly young students that you go with the Harvard undergrads and those who are grad students who come in like you do. The, the, the younger students come in saying, I want to be fill in the blank. I want to be the, you know, the governor of, of South Carolina, in, which in, if in this case, they shouldn't be at Harvard. They should be at the Citadel. Right. But they, they happen to be here and they, they want to be that because mom and dad said that they could be and, you know, whatever. Um, what we need to focus on is what it is that we want to do with our life. What kind of, what do we want to do? What's the work of your life, Dan? And I know the work of your life wasn't to be in Congress that you weren't even aiming for that when you were a student here. Um, hopefully if we can focus on how we want to make a difference, what the do is for us, education policy or competitiveness, whatever it may be, then you can do it in the private sector. And you can do it in the nonprofit sector and you can do it at local government and you can do it at the federal level. Um, and that's a, that's the kind of energy that will drive you through a career. And I'm sure that you can spot the handful of members who've gotten elected who are suddenly there and they don't really know why. I mean, we can tell them the first week when they're at the, at the orientation programs. Um, uh, and they're not going to they're not going to last. Uh, so focus on what it is that you want to do with your life. And then if a life in elective politics is it, like I said, five hundred and fifteen thousand elected officials in the United States. There's a, all kinds of places for you to get active. That's for sure. What are if, if you could do three reforms to the way Congress works, what would those be to make it work better? Whatever better means frankly. Hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's hard to parcel that off by itself because you need to try and reform um, how people are getting into elected office in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, within Congress, I'd like to see, um, uh, I'd like to see a place for everybody to live and stay in DC and limit travel back to the district. You want a um, dorm. You want us to live in a dorm and have dorm I do want hallway to parties and, dorm. and stuff. Actually, I wouldn't mind that because, I'm, you know, honestly, this is not an affordable, sustainable lifestyle, but <laughs> I wouldn't mind There's a dorm. A, um, a wonderful, actually, a couple of wonderful books on the very first Congress. The one is called The Washington Community, which was about the boarding houses that people lived in. Of course, that was before there were political parties. Um, I'd like to see much more space for there to be um, deliberation in private among members. And I would really like to see enforceable um, rules that, you know, punish people for outrageous uh, behavior that kind of tears down the institution. So you have the institution of Congress as this sort of living and breathing thing, this set of rules and procedures. And right now, the way you get elected to Congress is by saying, that place is terrible. Send me there and I'm going to fix it. You have everybody saying that place is terrible. Once you get there, you know, who's surprised? Um, it's a collective action problem. It's, it takes a lot of effort to try and, you know, rein in people who are clearly playing the short-term game to tear down the institution. So well, that short-term like game can be can be popular. I mean, we've sort of it's been a main theme of our conversation for the last hour is these incentive structures and that short-term game, which is basically driving people's emotions, getting the clickbait out there, being a performer instead of a legislator. And uh, you know, I went viral because I said that the other day. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you saw that. Yeah. Uh, it, it was funny as people. Everybody thought I was bashing the Freedom Caucus. I actually was not. Uh, that, that, I, that was like a 10 minute speech and it wasn't about the freedom caucus at all. Um, it, there was, there's certainly members it was about, and they might be in the freedom caucus or outside of the freedom caucus. It's about people who were willing to be untruthful, to get a rise out of you, willing to tell you something that they know will get a rise out of you because they know it's a popular narrative. 
but they're not willing to be leaders and say, guys, this isn't exactly how you think it is. Now, I spend a yeah. lot of my time doing that. One of the reasons I do a podcast is because I can have long conversations and the people who listen to this podcast know that. But it's very hard to do on Twitter. It's very hard to do on social media. And like you said, people are looking for that very easy answer. And when I say performers and legislators, hell, I obviously, I do cool performances. I mean, I jump out of airplanes, but that's for a political ad. There's a difference between that and political theater. Political theater is, is you know, going on a suicide mission uh, in the Congress that you know will look cool to constituents and you know you can message it well, but you know it goes nowhere. And it really is just polarizing and, and also counterproductive. That's what I mean. And there's legislators yeah. who are like working behind the scenes and just trying to just trying to get that bill together that'll make your drug prices a little bit lower. Right. And and uh, as I as we said at the beginning of this hour that, you know, the old rule used to be 80 percent of the work is done by 20 percent of the members. And now it's 90 percent of the work is done by 10 percent of the members. It is those. um those are the workhorses. So um, not in terms of entertainment, but uh, in terms of workhorses and show horses. I'm from Wisconsin and a show horse doesn't do you any good um, where I grew up. You have to have a workhorse. And that's what we want in Congress. We want we want to elevate somebody who's like us, who looks like us and sort of thinks like us, but is somehow better, you know, maybe a little <laughs> smarter, maybe doesn't have as many skeletons in their closet, uh, maybe somebody who's more likely to think about the long term, recognizing that I, David, am too often thinking about the short term. So I, I want to vote for somebody who's who's like me, but is also someone I can trust, uh, who's a trustee. It, it's, oh, I, I want to ask you a few different questions that I know I'm, I've taken up. Uh, you only said you had an hour. So uh, if if you do tell me when you got to go, but I've got a couple other topics I wanted to hit. One is a simple one. What do you think of term limits? Uh, um, I think they're a bad idea. And the, the, and I, and I think that for all levels, I certainly think they were a bad idea for the, the for presidents. Um, it was hotly debated by the founders. They, um, they were pretty close on whether or not to have term limits. We have uh, 34 states that have term limits. And so you can look at how things have run since the mid 1980s to the present in those states that have term limits and those that don't. And the evidence now is unambiguously clear where you have term limits on legislators, governors have become more powerful. Where you have term limits on legislators, lobbyists have become more powerful. Um, the, the best term limits are elections, free, fair, competitive elections, when you can get rid of somebody. Um, and really interesting empirical work has looked at so-called qualities of who's a quality legislator. Um, a guy named Jeff Montak did a, a great piece on this. And you see that about three election cycles in, in the U.S. Congress, the really lousy legislators are gone. And what you're left with are high quality legislators. I mean, think of your own favorites, of people who've done really good work. So um, there's a real appeal to term limits, um, but it is um, uh, empirically, when we look at what actually happens, it's a, it's a bad choice. Yeah, it what, empowers what? lobbyists, it empowers others, and you don't end up incentivizing people to stay and become policy experts. They're auditioning for some other job. They're going to move on in another way. Yeah. It, it, and that's exactly how it turns out in practice. When I'm asked that question, I basically answer it like this. I support term limits because you support term limits because you 90% of the public supports them. So I'll support them. But I'm also going to tell you the truth about the consequences of that. And I can't think of benefits to it. I'll support it because you guys are really, this is, this is one of those things where people just feel very strongly about it and uh, I'm not going to die on that hill, but I'm always very open and honest about what I actually think about them. And, um, you know, I, it's hard for me to find the pros and, and they'll be like, and I'll ask people like, why, why do you want this? And they'll say, well, you get, I mean, you got to get rid of Nancy Pelosi. And I say, okay, let's say she was limited out and she's gone. Yeah. And do you so think, Mitch McConnell, he'd and, be gone. And they would probably, oh, I mean, some people on our side will want that too. 
But I'm like, but I'm like, okay, so if Pelosi's gone, then then who do you think replaces her? Some reasonable person that you just that you love that you that that you think is respectable? No, of course not. It'll just be somebody just like her because in the in the end, it's the district votes for who they want, and it's a type of person, and so. You know, it's it's not going to change this thing, these these things very radically, and you're going to end up getting rid of people who are very good for your for your side. And so, you know, I, I like what Thomas Sowell says: there are no solutions, there are only trade offs. And yeah, it, that remains yeah, true. Yeah. All right, um, so that was one term limits. I'm against them. <laughs> All right, another I one. Elect- on the first time, the first time I came across it, I was I was in Michigan. And we were looking at uh, the term limits uh, proposal, which was part of the ballot initiative. Uh, I think it was in 1988. And this organization, Term Limits USA, uh, had funded it. And it wasn't a Michigan-led thing. All their money came from outside of the state. So afterwards, I, I went up to Lansing, East Lansing, to try and figure out, well, okay, let's look at the reports here. Where did the money actually come from? And Term Limits USA was overwhelmingly funded by two people I'd never heard of before. They were the Koch brothers. And why were they supporting term limits? Good reporting came out of San Francisco. The San Francisco, was it Examiner? I can't remember the name right now. Did a nice piece on it. Um, The Koch brothers funded term limits because they were libertarians. And they thought that was going to be the way that they could break through and take some of the seats away from Republicans. So even in its foundation, you know, myth about against, you know, incumbents, it was a ploy by one particular political party, uh, the Libertarian Party, to fund Term Limits USA. And uh, it's had all kinds of fairly negative consequences. Mainly, you're not encouraging people to become real experts in, in their time in the legislature. And lobbyists are the keepers of the of the keys. They understand how policy is made. I'd rather have elected officials figure that out. Yeah, I would say not just lobbyists, but staff and bureaucrats in the administrative yep. branch. That's uh, right. You know, because here's another question: do, do you think that there should be more funding for congressional staff? Because I think senators have pretty big staff, but I do not. Um, and sh- would that be helpful to the power of Congress? To have a bigger staff, I actually go back and forth on this because the truth is we have CRS, the Congressional Research Service. We have the CBO. We have these big organizations that are, have a lot of expertise that we can tap for whatever research we want. So I kind of go back and forth on this one. But maybe I would I would say I would like to pay my staff better. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, you're given the, you're given the um, equivalent uh, in terms of full-time equivalent. You can afford to probably hire 18 FTEs. And then you're going to be able to get some people who are going to cost share off of your committee and subcommittee assignments. And so if somebody looks at that, they say, oh, my goodness, what, Crenshaw gets 18 staffers? That's insane. Uh, well, remember, that's spread out also in your congressional office back home. Do you have two district offices or one? We have two. All right. And then, and then you have to have people that actually make the pr- place work. Um, it, you know, your office and every other member of Congress's office is like a small business. You know, you're not under OSHA requirements, right? Because you're the legislative branch, but you're, you're like a small business and there's got to be someone who's going to handle the paperwork and everything about making that business run. Um, and then when it comes down to actually having policy experts, your, your LAs and your LD, um, I'm guessing you have a chief of staff, one strong LD, and maybe three LAs who are affiliated with whatever committees and subcommittees you're on. Um, you know, that's probably not enough when you think about the amount of uh, work that's coming at you. Uh, and you want to be able to retain people. That's probably the biggest part. So, um, yeah, what, what we ended up doing is, is, is hiring less people and paying them more is, is because I want to retain expertise and ability. But in the end, I get it. It's just one of those things where you vote, the Congress would have to vote to raise that limit of, of what we can spend, what our budget is to hire people. And then people freak out about it. Like, what do you guys do? What are you doing? Just spend it. No, it's like, this is better for the legislative process if we want to take back power. All right. Another, another, another question. I'm just going to keep asking a say, question. When, when you look at actually when you guys have managed to raise uh, staff salaries in the past, it's done during a lame duck session. So 
yeah. after the election, when you still have the members around who are go- about to leave, um, they can't be punished at the ballot box. You know, then you might oh, yeah. be able to get that through. Well, there's staff salaries, and then imagine raising your member salary. You know, the millionaires like to like to be the first ones to get on the news and say we shouldn't be raising any of our salaries. Meanwhile, the rest of us are like, what the hell? Um, the the uh, an election reform because this is something you worked on. Um, you've um, what what were what were the biggest takeaways from? And I know this is a long time ago, the 2005 uh, Commission on Election Reform, but it's a pretty sensible set of election reforms and, and kind of plays into a the pretty big debate we've had over the last uh, couple of years on this. What, what, what would you think would be some things from that reform that Democrats and Republicans could agree on? Maybe that's a good way to phrase that question. I, I, one of the most important things that came out of the help America vote act is that we need to be able to audit what is actually happening in the machines. And um, you know, when I think about how elections were run when I was your age, <laughs> and it's like, oh my goodness, all kinds of shenanigans could have happened. I don't think they very often did happen. One of the great strengths of our system is that it's so incredibly decentralized. Um, so it's difficult for anybody to really coordinate uh, shenanigans. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I'm I'm a huge fan of the audit work that's been done. I think this is a place where transparency is crucial, uh, that the code needs to be uh, available for uh, qualified people to see what's actually going on in the machines, and that the results need to be uh, available for, you know, um, people like um, um, folks at the Caltech MIT voting groups, um, that they can audit these materials uh, quickly, almost in real time. There's very little fraud out there, Dan, as you probably know. There's fear of fraud. Uh, one of the things that I got to do briefly was uh, help the Boston Election Department uh, when they were going through a, a tough time. So I moved my office into City Hall, and we ran a couple of... Um, elections and tried to do things in, with new machines and so forth. And uh, I remember a television station coming up with this story about how dead people had voted. And I was like, oh, my goodness, what are they talking about? We had dead people vote. I was like appalled. You know, they're standing outside and talking about dead people having voted. So we obviously had to find out exactly what had happened. And we didn't have any dead people vote. Um, we had people who were had the same name as their dead parents, so they were still on the voting rolls. And when they checked in, they, they were checked in as the father or the mother. Um, and, and that accounted for all seven cases in the city of Boston that year. Um, so uh, there's, there's just very little real fraud out there when it comes to the actual administration. There can be fraud with sort of ballot harvesting in places that, say, do vote by mail. There's no question that that's something we ought to be worried about. Um, But when I was at the Boston Election Department, we renamed the department to the Department of Voter Mobilization because that's what we thought we ought to be involved in. Um, And I think that's what everybody ought to be involved in, getting more and more people active in voting, including people we disagree with. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I think a lot of our troubles, political troubles in the last couple of years would have been avoided with a very, very transparent audit system that, that has been normalized. I mean, I, you know, unfortunately, it has been weaponized and I fully admit that coming from my own side. But at the same time, I'm like, wait a second, what's wrong with an audit? What, honestly, like what, what's wrong with always doing audits? I, I, that seems like an important thing. Banks do them all the time. This is so important. And there is very little fraud, but there is fraud. And one vote swings an election. We have a member of Congress who won by six votes. I won my first election by 155. So it it, it can matter. And and I think more importantly, it drives the soul of our country crazy when they're not 100% sure that they lost or won. It drives people crazy. And we just, we have every interest in, in, in figuring that out. And like, I point people to this bipartisan commission often because it has a lot of good recommendations. 
uh, and things that we that we can easily I, I think we should easily agree on. Um, unfortunately, this this topic has become a little little too polarizing um, for for us to to get to anywhere on it. Well, the other the other part of the reality once we created the Election Assistance Commission is that. You know, Congress didn't fund it at levels that we were expected to. And then the commissioners didn't get named and the Senate kept, you know, saying, oh, no, we're not going to agree to this person. And they they hollowed out the organization that was supposed to be um, on the cutting edge of technology. So the material was there. But then, of course, politics got in in the way. And I just want to say unequivocally, as you know, um, I think that uh, the last presidential election was pretty cleanly won, run and that uh, that uh, Joe Biden clearly won the, the presidency. So it's it's hard for me to watch um, um, people nitpick things that aren't even close to being true. Uh, out there. And maybe if we had it all a little more open as, and, and the audits kind of automatic, we would be able to see how it works. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, would, I would hope that'd be something we can agree on. Yeah. Cause it, it, it would, it would, it would have saved everybody a lot of trouble. <laughs> that's, that's for damn sure. Um, is there, uh, is there any questions you have for me? I know I'm kind of keeping you past your time and I, I appreciate that. Do, do you have any questions for me that I could answer for your next class or <laughs> some kind of something I put you on the no, spot. Dan, there. I, I just, how, I guess the question is, how are you really doing? You doing all right? Um, yeah, I, uh, I am surviving. Look, I, when people ask me, do you enjoy this job? I'm like, well, it's not enjoyable the way the seal teams was enjoyable. That was a true joy for me. I'd wanted to do that since I was a kid. And yes, sometimes you get blown up and you lose your eye and that sucks. That part sucks. Um, but for the most part, you're you're with the, the best of Americans and people are, are striving towards a mission and you're doing what you love and you're jumping out of airplanes and you're blowing things up and it's awesome. And you feel purpose, right? It, fundamentally, what people want in their life is to feel purpose. That's right. And um, I, I'll tell you what, this job certainly gives purpose. I, I do it because I can make the broadest impact. And people ask, well, should I, you know, and people at Harvard, this is, this is a question I think for that, or an answer for students constantly is, should you go into policy or should you go into politics? And it depends, right? If, if you care about a single thing, a single issue, then maybe do it behind the scenes with policy. Uh, maybe figure out how to work different spheres of influence to get what you want done. Maybe you work for an influential member. Maybe, maybe you work for an influential group that advocates for a specific thing and you want to be an expert on this one thing. But if you want to be impactful in two ways, one, a broad variety of issues, but also a philosophy of governance, then you need to go into politics. Now, the reason my why, I never really answered that question to you, but my why was always the philosophy of governance. I believe deeply in a conservative philosophy of governance, and I believe in explaining to people what that is, because I don't think conservatives do it very well or very often. And to tell people that it's a process oriented philosophy that solves problems within a set of limiting principles. That's really important. It's, it's not so much the outcome we're looking for. I mean, outcomes are naturally derived from, from this philosophy, but the, but it's the process. It's the process of problem solving. It's the questions we ask. It's the trade-offs that we consider. That's why I did this. Cause I think it's so important to advocate for that particular philosophy of problem solving within government. I think it's more sustainable. I think it allows us to live together in the most peaceful way possible. It will never create the utopia you want. And I think this is a big difference between the right and the left. The left is always looking to create this utopia. And we don't even pretend that we're going to get there. We, we, I think, I, I, I think conservatives have a more humble understanding of what is possible with government. And, and there's, and that conflict is healthy, by the way, that's a very healthy balance and conflict yep. to have and we need to get back to the healthy balance somehow I'm not sure how i'm also not sure that i would that i would count america out at any point i still think um you know i i tweeted this during new year's 2020 and 2021 really sucked but you know what i'd still rather be in america than anywhere else and 2022 is still going to be pretty great to be in america yeah and maybe we should uh, remember that um Thank you for that. Uh, and 
I, I hope that some of those um, factions are going to come by your office and sit down and say, hey, you know what? I, I, I heard that podcast of yours. Mm-hmm. Let's have a talk. Go talk to the Democrats. They, you guys are going to share a vision of um, making this country better. And uh, I think the visions can be very similar. How you get there, that's going to be kind of fun. Well, what I remind people of is the vast majority of legislation that is passed I mean, passed, not even just introduced, I mean, passed is bipartisan. Now, it's not solving big, big problems. It's solving little problems. So, you know, there is a lot of bipartisan work that happens a lot. Um, and uh, it's, it's not, not all is lost. People, people don't always realize that. Yeah, but that's not what I meant. You know, what I meant was I hope we can, um, I hope you can enjoy a Congress uh, where you're sitting down and having good quality time with people with very different um, points of view. And the institution is poorly set up to do that. And when the institution can't do it, then Dan, you're going to have to do it on your own. Uh, that's very true. And we do. We've, we, we, we have beer. There's, there's still, there's still, it still happens. I don't I don't want you to, I don't want you to feel like it doesn't. It still happens. Unfortunately, some of my best friends on the Democrat side left like Tulsi Gabbard. I was friends with Joe Kennedy. Um, you know, so they're, they're, these beers do get had, and they're important. I agree. Yeah. Dan, thank you so much for hey, thank this you. chance to chat. This was fun. Of we could have done it for a couple more hours. Maybe we'll do it again. That sounds great. Be well. Thanks, David.